Topic notes 1.2, salinity. Now that we have a grasp of chemistry, it's time to get into the salinity of seawater. And this student is actually measuring salinity using a refractometer, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So let's jump into it. As always, it's important to focus on the main ideas before we get started. So here they are. Seawater is a solution made up of many different solutes dissolved in water. The salinity of the ocean is a steady state between inputs and outputs. Salinity can change in localized areas based on factors such as evaporation, precipitation, and runoff. Now also keep in mind, we're gonna be covering all of the specific learning goals listed below on this table. Now, if you've ever been to the beach or in the ocean, you've probably had seawater in your mouth before and you've noticed it tastes salty. Seawater is a mixture of different elements and compounds. It's actually quite a lot of stuff in there. Now to understand that, we have to understand solubility. So here's some definitions. A solution is a mixture of a solute dissolved in a solvent. So essentially the solvent is a substance which can dissolve other substances. I'll give you a hint, water. And a solute is a solid that dissolves in a solvent. Now remember how we mentioned how water is the universal solvent because of its polarity? If you're making that connection, you're on the right track. So now let's look at solubility. Solubility is the ability of a solute to dissolve within a solvent, such as water. And we call this dissolution, the process of being dissolved. So water is, again, known as that universal solvent because of its ability to dissolve a wide variety of solutes. And that is, of course, due to that polarity of water. And there are many solutes in seawater. For example, we have sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, oxygen, calcium carbonate. All of these dissolve in water. There is a difference between a solution and a mixture. A mixture occurs when two or more substances closely intermingle yet retain their individuality, such as a salad where you have lettuce and croutons and onions and things like that, but they all remain their individual selves. An example in the water would be sand. When you put sand in water, for the most part, it doesn't dissolve. But if you put sugar and salt in water, they completely disappear. You no longer can see the individual grains of salt or sugar. That's the difference between a solution and a mixture. Now, last note set, we talked a lot about chemistry and we mentioned ionic bonds. So now let's look at sodium chloride specifically as a solute. So remember, ionic compounds, which are created by the transfer of electrons from, in this case, sodium to chlorine. Both sodium and chloride gain a charge. Sodium becomes a positive ion and chlorine becomes a negative ion. The electrostatic charges attract each other, forming the sodium chloride bond. When placed in water, sodium chloride is easily dissolved when its ionic bond is broken by polar water molecules. Now remember, water molecules have partial positive and negative regions due to that um, unequal sharing of electrons, right? So the hydrogen area of the water molecules tends to have a partial positive charge and they attract the negative charge of the chlorine ion. So if you look at the top right of the image, you'll see those partial positive charged regions of the water molecules sticking to the negative chlorine. If you look at the partial negative region of the water molecule, which is around the oxygen, it is attracted to the positive ion of sodium. And so that bottom right image so shows sodium essentially being attracted to those partial negative regions of the water molecules. Solubility can be impacted by physical factors within the seawater. As temperature increases, the rate of dissolution of salts increase. If you look at the graph to the right, you'll notice as temperature increases along the x-axis, solubility also increases. This increased, also increased molecular motion helps mix ions into water, breaking ionic bonds. So now we can actually define salinity, which is a measure of the quantity of dissolved solids in ocean water. Salinity is expressed in what we call parts per thousand or PPT. You can also write it with essentially a percent sign with an extra zero there for the hundredth spot. 
the average salinity of the ocean is about 35 parts per thousand. So if you think about this visually, let's say you had a thousand bottles of water. If 35 of them were full of salts, the rest water, and you mixed it all together, that would be 35 parts per thousand. Just so you can get an image of what we're actually talking about. Now, salinity can vary. It can be super salty, that briny water. It can also be brackish, meaning it's mixed with fresh water. So it brings that salinity down below 35 parts per thousand to like 20 parts per thousand, things like that. And of course, fresh water is zero parts per thousand. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of stuff in seawater, and that includes lots of salts. Now, we have six inorganic salts that make up 99.28% by weight of all the solids in seawater. Now, the first two are, of course, the most common, sodium and chloride at 30% and 55% each. Sulfate, magnesium, calcium, and potassium also rank among the top. After that, there are a lot of minor inorganic constituents that also play a big role. All of them actually play a big role in the biological processes of the ocean in terms of, for example, um, what a crab needs to build its exoskeleton or a coral needs to build its skeleton in the coral reef. So that's why this stuff is important. Now, regardless of the concentration, these ions are generally present in the same percentages. That's the theory of constant proportions. And that essentially is meaning that, yeah, chloride and sodium are going to essentially have the larger share, but magnesium, calcium are also important. Many of these other micronutrients are found in much smaller concentrations, but they're very important to marine life and are often limiting factors in the marine environment for living organisms. So just to also clarify, remember, every time you change the chemistry of something, you kind of change the behavior of what's happening. So the normal properties of water are altered by the presence of a solute, in this case, inorganic salts. We call these colligative properties, water with inorganic salts included. These are some of their properties, increased ability to conduct an electrical current, decreased heat capacity, a raised boiling point, this is why you put salt in a pot of boiling water, decreased freezing temperature, slowed evaporation, increased osmotic pressure. Now, you know this if you've ever dealt with fish. For example, you can't take a freshwater fish and put it in salt water and vice versa because of the change in osmotic pressure, which is essentially how much salts are inside cells versus the outside environment. The salt cycle is a really important concept. Now, the ocean isn't getting saltier. That's because there's a certain amount of processes that add salts, but there's also a certain amount of processes that take salts away from the ocean. So now let's first start with the sources of sea salts, the inorganic constituents, if you will. Now, there's three from land, from inside the earth and from the atmosphere. Now, from land, you have minerals and chemicals that erode and dissolve into fresh water, and that flows into the ocean through rivers and streams. This can also include anthropogenic pollution, essentially man-made stuff that's in the water getting into the ocean. Now, from inside the earth, we have volcanoes and vents and other processes at the seafloor that spew minerals from below the earth's crust into the ocean. Then we have from the atmosphere, Atmospheric dissolution, essentially particles including minerals that can be carried by wind, precipitation, and deposited into the ocean. This includes natural sources such as volcanic ash and human-made sources such as increased carbon dioxide. There are several processes that remove sea salts from the water. If you've ever parked your car at the beach, especially in a windy day, and went out for a couple hours and played at the beach, came back, you might have noticed a bit of a salty film on your car. That's due to sea spray. Now, as waves crash along the shore, it sprays droplets up into the water that carries salts. And as that as those, uh, water actually evaporates, it leaves the salts behind. It's actually a source of some uh, degradation of basically man-made structures along the beach as well, but it's a removal of salts. Then there's biological processes, which is a really huge source of salts. Organism, marine organisms use calcium, silica, and other constituents to build their exoskeletons, their bones, their endoskeletons, um, all of these sorts of body parts. And so they're very important at, at removing those from the water itself. 
Then we have absorption and deposition on the seafloor, where essentially salts get deposited on the ocean floor for long periods of time. Now, as I mentioned before, the ocean doesn't seem to be getting any saltier. It's considered the steady state concept. Essentially, we have a chemical equilibrium between the inputs and the outputs, but there are local variations. Remember when I told you there are certain areas that get hypersaline, some that become brackish with a little lower salinity, things like that. So, but we're talking an overall ocean thing. Overall oceanic salinity seems to be relatively steady. Now, also keep in the back of your mind that it probably took billions of years to get to that point of steady state. Now, local variations are very important. Salinity varies locally due to the water cycle and local conditions. Processes that change salinity include evaporation, which increases salinity because as evaporation occurs, it only takes the water away, it leaves the salt. So that means it gets more and more salty. Freshwater input also from rain or precipitation or from river or canal outfalls will decrease salinity because essentially you're diluting the salt water. This especially happens in coastal regions. We also can have variation based on latitude. Various latitudes experience different rates of evaporation and precipitation. For example, the subtropics have a low precipitation and a high evaporation situation, and thus their salinity tends to be a little bit higher. Equatorial regions have a high precipitation and a low ocean salinity. Now the term hypersaline is when a body of water has a salinity level greater than 40 parts per thousand. Now the most hypersaline environment in the world is the Don Juan Pond in Antarctica, which gets up to 440 parts per thousand. Even at negative 50 degrees Celsius, the pond doesn't freeze because of how salty it is. Now, the last thing I'll mention is measuring salinity because we're going to be doing this in class. We can measure salinity in a variety of ways. Scientists actually use what we call a CTD or a conductivity temperature depth sensor that they'll drop over the side of a research vessel or a ship and they'll drop it through the water column and actually get data on all these sorts of things. And conductivity essentially puts kind of electric current through the water and the more salts in the water, the better the current flows. And so you get a measure of the salinity. Now here in class, we're gonna be using what we call a refractometer. And what this does is you put a droplet of water on the face plate of the refractometer and light penetrates that water. And essentially the more salts in the water, the more the light is bent and thus it reads on a scale. And you can see the scale over there on the bottom right. Now we use the, the column on the right, which is the parts per thousand goes from zero to a hundred. The scale on the left is actually the specific density, and we'll not really get into that too much at this point in time, but it's something else to learn another time. All right, that's it for today. Like always, make sure you review the main ideas and the targeted learning goals that you understand what it is that we've covered so you're ready for assessments in the future. And of course, until next time, keep learning.